So if you follow this news out, you've probably seen our recent trip to the U.S.-Mexican border. We went there last month to the Yuma sector in southern Arizona, and it's a place on the border where more than 51% of the fentanyl that enters the United States crosses. Now, we learned on that trip that it doesn't take long for those drugs to work their way through our country into our communities with increasingly tragic consequences. And we're here today. A very special guest has come on our show who's going to talk about some of those consequences, the impact on her life, on her family. Janet, I want to thank you for being here. Let me ask you this question, first of all. Janet Smoke, before we get into everything that you've been through, your family, tell us a little bit about you. You're at Lexington Medical Center. You yes. live here in the Midlands. Tell us a little bit about you and your family. Well, thank you. First, thank you for having me on your podcast. I appreciate that. Um, I My name is Janet Smoke. I am a director of patient accounts at Lexington Medical Center. Prior to that, I worked at Lexington Medical Center for 16 years in the physician network as a division administrator. Um, so my heart bleeds green. <laughs> um, work, family, church, that's my life. And you guys live in the Midlands? Yes, we live in the Midlands. Um, my husband works for Lexington School District 2 in Human Resources. And I have my oldest son, um, Jacob, is 27. Yeah? No, he's not. Well, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> you, you don't have to remember all the days. <laughs> I've got a few kids too. I often forget their <laughs> ages, but my oldest son lives in Charleston. He got okay. married in June of 2021. Very cool. And what so does he almost do? Almost two two years now. He is a teacher. Okay. Yes, he is a teacher in the Charleston school district, and his wife Bree, um, the daughter that I've never had on my own, but absolutely love her. Um, she works for Seacoast um, mm-hmm. Church. What I want to ask you now about Justin, your younger son. Tell us a little bit about about him. Love outdoors, love sports. What are some of your memories of him coming up? Um, Justin was a happy child. He was he loved to joke around. Um, I recently found a video of him at Disney where he had told me before we went he was going to eat ice cream every day. <laughs> and, of course, we didn't have sound on whatever device we recorded on back then. Um And he was just moving his head around, eating that ice cream, just loving it. And that that's the Justin, the young Justin that I remember. Um, As Justin went into middle school, um, things started changing a little bit. Um, I wish I could say that I was a parent that picked up on everything, but I didn't. The main thing I remember was that he stopped smiling in pictures. And that's what I picked up on was he's not smiling in pictures. Um, He was also getting in trouble at school, um, and one day I found marijuana in his room. And, of course, I went straight to counseling. If I could do things over, I probably wouldn't jump straight to counseling. Um, But that was middle school. Um, He was diagnosed with ADHD, and he was prescribed Adderall, but he didn't take it for very long. He didn't like the way it made him feel. And later I came to learn that um, he realized that when he smoked pot, he relaxed. That took care of the the distractions that he was having. Medicated I'm sure that's himself. not the only reason that he took it, but but that is one of the reasons. Self medication is certainly one of the reasons. Absolutely. Um, once he got into high school, that's really when we started noticing additional problems. Um, he got into some legal trouble, um, and that was our first experience with court and than jail, um, unfortunately. Um, I would like to just gloss over that, but that was part of Justin's life, you know. Um, It made an impact on the whole family. Um, And it was bad decisions that he made. He never got in trouble with the law for drugs. Usually it was stealing so he could buy drugs. Um, Once um, he graduated from high school, um, he ended up a few years later, moving to Albuquerque to live with my sister. And he um, 
he really was doing better. He was starting to show that he was productive. He was res he was becoming responsible. He worked at a restaurant as a dishwasher, and he loved his job. He would go in before shift and help clean the office. He said, I can put my headphones in, my earbuds in, and, and I'm good to go. And then with dishwashing, he didn't have to interact with anybody. He, that was the job for him. He loved it. Um, and we saw him starting to thrive. Um, but then he moved back to South Carolina um, a few years, maybe a year, year and a half after that, um, and more legal issues. He mm -hmm. fell back into the same patterns with drug use, jail again. Um, this time he stayed in jail for a little while um, because we didn't feel we could bring him home yet. Mm -hmm. um, after, after jail... Um, Actually, I have my timeline a little wrong because it That's was okay. after that stint in jail that he actually went to Albuquerque to live with my sister. Uh, sorry about that. No, but you guys are dealing with a lot, obviously. Now, let me yes. ask you this, though. When you were noticing these changes in him and these the, the drug issues, you always you're, you told me earlier we were talking about it, you never got the sense he was giving up, though. You never got the sense that, no. that you felt like this was something he was constantly fighting Yes, actually. Um, the very first time he went, we took him to Palmetto Health Adolescent Recovery Center. Mm -hmm. That might not be all the right words in the right order. Um, but he went there for the outpatient program. When they did his initial interview, they came back and told us that Justin didn't have a problem right then. But if his behavior didn't change, he would become an addict. And unfortunately, that is what happened over time because Justin, it felt like we were on a constant roller coaster. Justin would be clean, he would get, then something would happen, he would lose his job or he would get in trouble. Um, and it, later we would find out that, well, he was doing drugs. Um, so that's when he would relapse. Then he would have a period where he would do okay, he would get clean again, he would get a job, and then the same thing would happen this over went on and over. For for um, years or for probably not probably nine years total oh, wow. at least um it was a long period of time um yeah sorry no, that... <laughs> it was a long period of time and a lot of the things that i talked about um happened over the course of those years um when he was in albuquerque he did really good mm. when he came back home that's when we started, he started doing, using pills again. And, and I don't really know at what point in his life he started using pills, but, but he did. Um, I want to say he probably went to four different rehabs before he actually chose one himself. Um, and if I could go back and do some things differently, I don't know if I would have pushed him for every single one of those times. I wanted it. I don't know if he was ready for it. Um, I had cancer in 2019, breast cancer, and when I rang the bell after finishing um, chemo treatments, the next day Justin got on a plane and he went to Colorado Springs and he checked himself into Peaks Recovery Center. When he was back in Albuquerque, him and my sister had researched recovery centers and he had found that one and um, he just never took the leap, but after chemo with me, he then took the leap. Um, we saw a lot of him, a lot of change with Justin at that time. Um, the family weekend was good. Um, we opened up, we talked quite a bit. Um, of course I was still recovering, you know, so, um, there's probably a lot I don't remember about that trip as well. I remember one of the exercises that they had us do. It was, um, say, we all had to close our eyes in the room, all the families and all of the patients. And we needed to just say things that we wanted to say to our loved one that we had not said before. And it was eye-opening and it was challenging all at the same time. And I go back to that a lot now because there's so many things I would like to tell him. And I've been just closing my eyes and thinking about it, um, but it's not the same. It's not the same as being able to call your son or FaceTime him or him come over and say, hey, I just want to tell you this. I recognize this. There's a lot of things that I would do differently. There's a lot of things I wouldn't do differently. Um, Those are things you'd tell him if you could, that you'd do, a, do things to? Yes, there would be some things that I would tell him. I now understand. 
I think that's probably the biggest thing that I would tell him is there's some things that I understand now that I didn't understand back then. But you do have a message from him that you keep very close. Yes. And you've given us permission to, to show this. And I wanted to play this real quick for for our audience. But this was one of the final memories. Walk us through, set us up for this uh, this ring video we're about to see. So Jim. it was July 20th, um, just a few days before Justin actually passed away. He had come over to our house that evening. And my husband and I were talking to him while we were in the sunroom. And we were talking about... Um, an issue, a, a, a situation that had just recently happened with one of his friends or acquaintances, I honestly don't know. Um, but the person was in his car and had OD'd on heroin. And Justin actually revived him by using Narcan. Okay. And that made a big impact on Justin. I could see him struggling. And he just went back and forth. He had his eyes closed and he was going back and forth of, I got to let him go. But Mama, if I let him go, he's going to die. But I got to let him go. If I do, he's going to die. And he had that struggle. It was real. Um, you know, you talk about the good and the evil angels that sit on your shoulders. I saw that with him, with that struggle with him. Um, that night, my husband asked him, Justin, are you an addict? And that's the first time in all of the years that Justin had been struggling that he said yes. Um, I, so I do feel like he was trying to make a difference, um, that this was, that he was on a, a different trajectory, trajectory, I think yeah. is the right word, that he had been in some of the other years. But I don't have my head in the sand. I know that he bought the drugs. I know that he took them. And unfortunately, they contain fentanyl. But that night, he, um, he, as he was leaving, he said that he loved Jesus. He knew Jesus loved him. And that now has become the greatest gift that he could have ever given me over his entire life. Um, I have found much comfort in that. But then as he was leaving, thanks to technology and a doorbell camera, I have a beautiful, um, anytime that I want to hear his voice, I can hear him say, I love you, Mama. Well, let's play that real quick if we can, Dale. I'll see y'all soon. I love you. I love you too, Mama. Same thing. Okay, you too. But the one thing I keep going back to, if you I know we're not supposed to have regrets, counseling has taught me no, woulda, coulda, shoulda. <laughs> um, but after, when I told, the night I told Justin that I had cancer, he had come back over to my house and he told me, don't die on me, Mama. If I could go back and tell him one thing, I would say, don't die on me, Justin. Let me ask you about that day, July 25, 2021. How'd that day start for you, Janet? The day was just like any other day. I went to church. Um, let me go back to the Saturday before, um, because Justin would come over to our house on the weekends, and he had called me that Saturday and um, he said he might come over. Later that day, he called us, and um, he FaceTimed my husband and I, and he was so happy and proud that he had bought a 76ers hat because that's my husband's favorite basketball team. So he showed us that, and we talked for a little while. He didn't come over that day, which was okay. Um, he was starting to talk about moving into an apartment, so I was sending him screenshots of different apartments that I was looking up for him. And that night, um, I don't remember what time, but he said, thank you, Mama, and, um, or thank you. Um, but he acknowledged the, the text that I had been sending him. That next morning on the way to church, I sent another one, <laughs> and I didn't get an answer that day. I didn't think anything of it because I didn't talk to him every day. He's 24 years old. Um, 10 o'clock at night, we, my husband and I had just gotten into bed. And the doorbell rang. And it. when I first saw the blue and gold uniform, my first thought was, oh, goodness, he's been arrested. And then he turned around and it said deputy coroner. And his license was on the clipboard. And that was tough. It was tough. You knew immediately? Well, 
my husband knew immediately. It wasn't until he said who he was that it all connected with me. Um, what did they tell you? What did? How did they explain what happened? I don't know if I remember the exact words. Um, I do remember my husband asking me because I had already taken my evening medicine and I had got, started going to sleep. And at one point, my husband said, Janet, you do realize what is going on, right? And I was like, yes. I think I immediately went into business mode <laughs> because that's my nature. Um, and I don't really think I stopped until the day before the funeral. And that's when it really started hitting me. Um, there's actually, there's a lot of work that has to be done to plan a funeral when you're not expecting it. Um, I'm trying to think when he came in, he told us that um, he needed to talk to us, that um, that it was not good. Well, actually, I think it was my mom that was behind him that said, Janet, it's not good. Justin lived with my mom at that time, my mom and my stepdad. Um, so they were the ones that actually found him that afternoon. And of course, they immediately called 911, and everything started from there. And then my husband and I were the next of kin, so that's why the coroner came to our house to inform us of Justin's death. And I'm trying to recall the words, but I can't, I can't even recall the words. I just remember him in the living room and talking to us. Um, and I do remember saying, he doesn't have to struggle anymore. That's the one thing I remember from that night. Um, and then after that, the next day, it just started with funeral home and um, cemetery and everything that we had to do. Justin liked bling, for sure. Um, he, he loved um, brand name stuff. Um, and I feel like we did, we did what he would have liked. Um, I had gone in saying he needs a blue casket. Justin has gorgeous blue eyes. You can see them in this, this picture. Um, he has his grandmother's eyes and his dad's eyes, but even accentuated. Um, and I remember saying blue was his favorite color. He has to have a blue casket. And when we got to the funeral home, I didn't like the blue caskets. <laughs> so they brought out the whole catalog for me, you know. And when he, the director flipped the page and there was this black with... Um, brass accents and all three all of us in the room my husband my son my daughter-in-law we all said that's it so it was black with brass accents his um, marker on his grave is black with gold and he would have just loved it it's rich looking <laughs> and that's <laughs> what bling. Justin would have loved yeah. yes that's as much bling as I could give him <laughs> let me throw something out there and you tell me if you think this is accurate if you agree with this your son didn't go looking for fentanyl. Absolutely but not. Fentanyl found him. Correct. It was not a. Yes. It was a, another substance that yes. had been laced. Is that what you've? Yes. Um, come to be told. Justin had had conversations before, and his vices were Xanax and Percocet. Um, my husband and I had had conversations with him go back to a state where marijuana is legal, just trying to get him to do things the right way. You know, um, Justin was a good kid. He just made some bad choices, you know. Or he was doing what, I even don't want to say bad choices anymore. He was doing what, on one hand, what would help him sleep. That's usually when he would take the pills. Now, I was not a part of every single day of his life, so I don't know if he took them more often or not. It's very possible. But I know he took them at night, and it would help him sleep. That's not the right way to do it. I know that. But that's what he had found, and that's what he was doing. That was his life. I really thought that when we got the toxicology report back that it would say Xanax or Percocet, but it didn't. It said marijuana. I would have expected that, uh, Valium and fentanyl. The fentanyl was lethal. Justin had told me before, he didn't always want to be here, but he didn't want to die. This was not an intentional suicide. I'm just going to say it as strong as I feel, if that's okay. Please. My son was poisoned. He did not ask for fentanyl. 
Yes, he overdosed, and I understand overdose. But there's an education that needs to be out there because there is different than an intentional overdose of fentanyl or even an accidental overdose of fentanyl and fentanyl poisoning. Fentanyl poisoning is when you are not, you're expecting one thing and you get fentanyl. I saw a meme recently on Facebook and it was a great picture of that. And it was Snow White taking an apple from the witch. And on her side, it was shiny and red. And on the other side, it was, you could see green for harm. That's the picture of fentanyl because you're getting what you think you need but you don't realize what all it takes, what all it contains. And unfortunately for my son, that was it. The coroner did tell us that, um, that it was fast, that Justin, it looked like Justin was in his evening routine. So I guess I do remember more. Um, he was in his evening routine. His hand was almost like he was going to sleep. And I, I I don't know if this is a personal thing or not, but I think it shows the point of how quick it was. Justin had highlighters in his hand, and my whole family has struggled with why in the world did he have highlighters in his hand? And the more I have thought about that, Justin must have gone to pick up the highlighters off of his bed. He got in his bed, he laid down, and he didn't even have time to drop the highlighters. That's how quick fentanyl works. We'll talk about highlighting. You are highlighting something here because what you said earlier, let's just assume even if even if Justin were looking to recreationally use a drug, he wasn't looking to recreationally use this kind of exactly. dangerous drug. And you've got so many people, whether they're trying to sleep, whether they've got chronic pain, yes. and you know, they run out of a prescription or they end up in this situation where they think they're getting something that's going to do one thing. And obviously, yes. this is dramatically different. But I wanted to ask you, talking about highlighting this issue, this is your first time speaking up. I wanted to ask yes. you kind of your journey. What led you to be comfortable, to be willing? And, and I guess, what are you looking to communicate and accomplish by, by stepping forward, Janet? The night before the visit, though I guess that was the day before the visitation. It might have been even the day of Justin's visitation, the day before the funeral. I put my hand on Justin, and I told him that I would be his voice, <laughs> that I wouldn't let it stop. I would be his voice. At that time, I had no clue of what it would lead to. At my honest thought was, is it about young children and starting drugs and experimenting with marijuana. I had no idea. I now know my voice for him is about fentanyl awareness. My message to parents of young children is you have to be educated. You have to know what's going on. Justin bought this pill in our community. It was either Lexington or Richland County. He wouldn't tell me exactly where because he didn't want Mama showing up because he knew Mama, he knew Mama had showed up at other places. And I probably would have. It probably would have been dangerous, but I probably would have. <laughs> um, but parents have to know. Some of the fentanyl that's coming into our country now is in the form of candy. I believe it looked like Skittles. Parents have to be aware. They have to know how to talk to their children. They can't take candy from other children because they don't know where it came from. What about the children that are coming from homes that, that the parents may not even know, you know? For parents of teenagers, young adults, and for young adults themselves, you have to be educated as well. Not necessarily abstinence, because for young children, of course, you would preach abstinence. If, if my teenager if I could go back and rewind and it was Justin, I don't think that I would have been so hard on him as I was. I would have preached abstinence because my message to both of my boys was, it is illegal in this state. We don't do things that are illegal. You don't drink until you're 21 and then that's your choice. That's how I preached to them. But if I could go back now, there are so many things I would tell Justin about, son, 
you can't, you don't know. I, I used to tell him, unless it comes from a prescription bottle from a pharmacy, you can't trust it. But I know that you can buy those things on the internet. <laughs> and people were doing that because he had a prescription bottle without a label on it. So he thought he was doing okay because he was buying it from someone who told him he had a prescription. Hmm. But a prescription from a pharmacy would not have contained fentanyl. Parents, you have to know what is going on in our communities, what is going on and your children are faced with, because it's not the same as when I was growing up. Um, and I'm going to say this is bold also. We cannot allow this to continue because just the change from when I was a teenager to when my son was a teenager, God forbid, how is it going to be when my oldest son has children and they're teenagers? If we don't stop the war with fentanyl now, how is it going to be in 10 years? How is it going to be in five years? Just the statistics that I don't know off the top of my head, but from 2022 to halfway through 2023, we had already surpassed numbers from 2022. I want to say that was in deaths. Well, and actually, Janet, as you're talking, I'm going to have uh, Dylan Nolan pull up some of these statistics that we've got from the Department of Health and Environmental Control Good. from the State Law Enforcement Division and their responses to drug calls. And so if you look at any of these charts, it's it's like a hockey stick. These numbers yes. are just going through the roof yes. and those statistics just, just jarring. But I wanted to focus on something else. You've got a tattoo on your wrist there yes. and I wanted to see if there's a way we could uh, I'll put Dylan on the spot here if you can maybe hold that up there I want you to tell us tell us a little bit about this and what it means yes and I never could... thought I would have gotten a tattoo <laughs> but after Justin passed away that's immediately what I wanted and this is an awareness ribbon the purple signifies overdose it's also the color that um, the fentanyl awareness groups have chosen for fentanyl and the green is for mental health awareness. So that's my talking point. That's why I got it. That's why I got it on my wrist, because I can see it every day. And it's a reminder to me. But also, it's a talking point. It's an icebreaker. And then Justin's name is written on there. And that is actually how he signed Kevin's Father's Day card the June before he passed away in July. And you were telling us about this picture, too, here. This is the one Yes. just a month before the wedding. Yes. Uh, his brother's wedding. Jacob and Bree got married on June 13th of 2021. And then Justin passed away on July 25th of 2021. So in 13 days, it will be two years of the anniversary of the death of my son. Well, you don't just keep track of the years, do you? You were telling me earlier <laughs> you've got it down to the, the day, don't you? Yes, I do. Um, it's 717 days. I have a countdown on my calendar, on my phone. And at first I was looking at it a lot. And I have healed some to where I'm not looking at it every day. Um, but it's there as a reminder that this is how long it's been since we haven't seen my son. That's probably not a good way to heal with grief. But one day I do have hope that grief will not, the feelings that grief causes will not lead my life. Um, but my life will never be the same. Every life that Justin touched will never be the same because they no longer have their friend. They no longer have their brother, their son, their grandson, their cousin, their nephew. He's not here anymore. It's very evident on holidays. Holidays are the hardest because he's no longer there. Well, he is because I have a candle with his picture on it, but it's not the same. Parents have to know. People have to be aware. The days of experimenting are over because you never know what's in that pill. Justin thought he was getting either Xanax, Percocet, or Valium, and I'll never know the answer to that. I'll never have peace about that, and that's okay but he didn't ask for fentanyl. Two milligrams of fentanyl can kill. One pill, one line can be it, can kill. DHEX program is one pill can kill. Well, one pill did kill Will. It killed my son. 
and that's in our community. That's one too many. You've got that beautiful message from your son telling you he loves you. What do you want to say to him back? I love you, buddy. Oh, how I love you. I know that one day we'll be together again, and I look forward to that. But until then, I will be your voice. Fentanyl has to stop. Janet Smoke, thank you so much. Thank you, Will.